Hello, welcome everybody to the No Normal Show for Thursday, December 17th, 2020, brought to you by Revive Health. This is our weekly deep dive in how hospital and health system marketers can navigate what we call the no normal. I'm Chris Bevelo, health systems practice lead at Revive Health and your host for the show. I am joined by Chase Kleckner, who is senior marketing manager at Revive Health and our show's producer. Hello, Chase. Hey, Chris, good to see you as always. Good to see you for the final show of the year. Maybe we weren't sure if this is the final show of the, <clears throat> the decade. We're not sure if this is the end of the decade, when we can get into that in a little bit. But either way, we're going out with a bang um, because of the guests we have with us. We are really excited to have Adam Braes, who is the Division Chair of Strategic Intelligence at Mayo Clinic as our guest on this show. In that role, he leads a team who assesses the external environment to identify trends, threats, and opportunities that impact Mayo Clinic strategies. His team forecasts scenarios and analysis that his team forecasts scenarios and analysis that inform strategic decision making, and he's extensively involved in Mayo Clinic strategic planning efforts. Adam, welcome. Hey, hi, Chris. How are you? Do you know if this is the end of the decade? Have no. we already end the decade? That is, I don't. I don't know what area of expertise uh, calendaring is. Uh, but it is not mine. I, you don't I, have a degree in calendaring? Do not, no. No. I, have I other, know people. Oh, go ahead. I have other degrees, but not uh, calendaring is not a strong suit. <laughs> people get very sensitive about it. They get very upset if you get this wrong. Maybe somebody can post in the chat channel. Um, I, I just have heard nobody talking about this is the end of the decade. So that makes me wonder whether it truly is. Of course, everybody's trying to move on from 2020. We're just right. focused on this year. Um, but I do believe we're starting the 2020s and you don't start that with the zero year. You start that with the first year, which is 2021, which would make me think this is the 10th year of the 20 aughts or whatever we the 20 teens or whatever the last thing was called, not the aughts, the teens. Anyway, I'm going on way too long about this. Somebody please educate us, throw it in the chat channel. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to use chat and Q and a here in a second. And Adam, thanks for joining. We will dive in with you. Um, very shortly, just some housekeeping notes. If you're new to the show, uh, what we do here is share industry trends, research, stories, thinking um, for folks within and outside of healthcare, all with the hope of helping health system marketers and communicators navigate what we call the no normal successfully. If you want to know more about what we mean by the no normal, if you want to understand the principles that we've developed to help navigate the no normal, please see that chat function in Zoom. Uh, Chase will post a link to that for you. In fact, Chase will be posting other things there likely as we go along. It's a great place to look for uh, content that we're sharing, uh, or you can talk to uh, other participants in the show. Do that in the chat function. If you have a question, however, for Adam or myself or Chase as we go through the show, please put that in the Q&A queue. That is what we monitor to listen for questions, uh, which we should have plenty of time at the end of uh, our discussion to go into questions, or we can answer them as we go along, depending on what the question is. So make sure they, they go in there. Uh, it's harder for us to monitor the, the chat, which sometimes get in, gets into a robust side conversation, which we are um, greatly appreciative of. So please have that side conversation. Remember, this is a podcast. You can subscribe to it. In fact, most people actually uh, tune in that through that means you can find us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. We also post our video recording of this show by the end of the day, each day we do this. You can find that at our website at thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. We have a ton of other things there. Uh, we have our most recent vaccine survey report there. We are constantly putting out information on the no normal, on COVID-19, um, so you can find all of that there. And before we dive in, this is the third week in a row. We've had to stop for just a second. We don't have to belabor this, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, we have this show every Thursday. It seems this is the third week in a row that Wednesday is a day of note when it comes to COVID-19 in the United States. So using the New York Times, we set a record for daily deaths yesterday. Uh, astounding number, 3,611. You, you see the chart in the New York Times, which we've all looked at probably over and over and over. They're going to have to change the chart 
the chart only goes to 3000. And so now they're up above it and it's almost inevitable because typically the numbers get worse today and tomorrow. Um, Thursday and Friday are usually the worst numbers of the week for whatever reason. Uh, so it's, it's likely we could hit 4,000 and they may need to change that graph, which says so much. Uh, it's a 14 day change of uh, increase of 57%, which is super scary. New high of hospitalizations, 113,000 nationally. And really the highest day for daily cases at 245,000. There was a day last week, the 11th, which was higher, but that was one of those that they report uh, as an anomaly. So it's kind of a one, a once, a one-time kind of boost. In this case, it was Texas that began reporting probable cases and that led to a one day increase of 44,000 just for that day. So it, you don't really wanna count those and just look at the normal days yesterday was the highest. So I don't know that we want to belabor it. Uh, we keep hearing it's going to get worse before it gets better. We're going into the holidays, which is likely true. But we also know we've got vaccines that are starting to roll out. Uh, Adam, you shared that your vaccine is starting on the 21st. Is that right? At Mayo Clinic? That, that's right, Chris. We, um, <clears throat> we should be receiving our shipments uh, today, I believe. Uh, and then the plan is to begin rolling that out quickly. Ironically, the the 21st is also the shortest day of the year, thus the darkest day of the year. So um, some bit of symbolism there, I think, even as our physicians say, uh, you know, that there is there is hope uh, emerging out of this uh, darkness. And, um, and I think that, that we're seeing that sentiment even with consumers. If you look at uh, where people's attitudes were uh, in midsummer, uh, even into early fall, uh, we're starting to see this, this hope emerge. And it'll be interesting about, you know, to see what that means for the, for the rest of the course of this pandemic, because uh, we, we looked at some research early this summer that indicated that there's a social end to the pandemic before the medical end of the pandemic. And um, that actually makes the medical end harder uh, yeah. because, you know, people have said, hey, pandemic's over. I'm going to go about my life. And, and uh, you know, you can't do that uh, necessarily. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out if, if this follows other pandemics in the past, which have that social end first. Yeah, it, that is, it's a great symbolism. And I know that, you know, vaccines are being distributed at different dates, but I, I love the idea that, hey, this is the, this is the the kind of the, the turn here. It's the darkest day, it's the shortest day. Moving forward, it only gets better. It also happens to be an important day in astronomy as we were learning before we got on the call. It's the day of the great conjunction, which if you care about that, everybody should care about that. That's pretty cool. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter are going to be aligned in a way closely enough that we haven't seen in 800 years. Uh, and so actually, if you can see it, if you're able, in part of the country where you're able to see this, it could look like a double star. Uh, it's supposed to be pretty incredible to see if you can see it. So that also, I, I would like to throw that into the symbolism as something, a guiding star, a positive thing. There's a lot of ways we could go with that symbolism. We'll just leave it there. Uh, it, I, we were talking about how I'm a fan of TikTok. And if you're on TikTok, you've heard people mention the Great Conjunction in many different ways. But we won't get into all of that. Uh, let's do talk, though, Adam, about what you do. Uh, we're really excited because just in prepping for this uh, conversation we're having today, you shared some of the things that you do, some of the things that your group uh, has found in, in what they're thinking about, whether it's next year or 2030 or maybe even beyond. So we can't wait to get all to, to get to all that. But let's just start with strategic intelligence. What does that mean at Mayo Clinic? What's its role? Uh, that's your group. Tell us about that first. Yeah. I, uh, thanks again, Chris. I think that it's you know uh, I would say that I have one of the best jobs in healthcare, and I'm sure others would would debate that with me, but. But this is really cool work. Uh, you know, a little bit about me. So I've been at Mayo about 20 years. I spent most of my time in marketing and communications. I, I led marketing for a time before moving into this role in our strategic planning area. And the idea behind that uh, three years ago is that we would build a function uh, which, which could bring um, these various aspects of intelligence, uh, market research, market analysis, and, and um, kind of competitive intelligence uh, together to form this body of strategic intelligence, which helps, uh, helps us do strategic planning, helps us make strategic decisions, um, and really helps us as an organization look outside and forward. 
right? So how do we understand what's happening in not only in the healthcare space, but in other markets that might jump to healthcare? And how do we plan for 10 years out? We have, we have projects that we're working on right now that are one year out, two years out. We have uh, the body of work that we're talking about today, I think is largely focused 10 years out. Um, and then we even have a project that goes out to 2070, which is, you know, that when you start thinking about what will the world be like um, when you're probably not around anymore, um, that gets to be a pretty interesting proposition. And, and um, the work is fascinating. Uh, we have a team of really curious learners uh, who go after it. And um, I think it's been really well received by the organization. We continue to build this capability um, and, and it's, a, it's a really cool job. So, so yeah, so I'm assuming in your 2070 work, you haven't discovered anything or, or land on something that will actually extend our lives to see 2070. I'm assuming from your setup that that's not part of what you found, but talk more about how you look at the future. How are you forecasting the future? Just kind of give us a description, whether it's, you know, next year's the future, but I think most of us tend to think about like your point 2030 or, you know, crazily enough, 2070. How do you guys go about that? So it, it all starts with, with, um, the way that you put together various aspects of, of what you're seeing. So for our work, what we do is we do um, on an annual basis and even in between, we're looking for trends. So we're looking for a collection of trends. And, and the first time that we did this uh, was in 2018, uh, we identified more than a hundred trends. Uh, you know, some were healthcare related, some were macro related um, beyond healthcare and affecting every single industry. And then we narrowed that work down to 30 that we said, oh, this, these could be pretty uh, impactful for, for not only our organization, but for, for healthcare in its entirety. And then where the, the really interesting work begins is when you start putting them together, right? So if, if these three trends occur and they occur at the same time, what does that mean for the future environment? What does that mean for healthcare providers? More importantly, what does that mean for consumers and patients? Um, and that's, that's really where we spend the bulk of our time is in trying to anticipate when you start to put together these collections of things, because that's how the world evolves. It evolves, you know, through a series of actions, not one independent action happening in and of it by itself. Uh, but, but through these collection of actions, what does that translate to? Um, very early in our work, um, and I think we have a, a couple of slides here that we can share very early in our work we uh, developed these five forecasts. So in our strategic planning process at Mayo, we were looking out to 2030 and we said, well, what, what does it look like when you put some of these things together? And we created these five forecasts, um, which are near and dear to me because I have a meteorology degree. So anytime I talk about forecasts, I get, uh, I get excited about that. But this first one was this idea that you could get an accurate diagnosis anytime, anywhere. And when you think about the power of that, right? That you don't need to go to a physician, that, that artificial intelligence, um, big data, that, that uh, 5G transmission rates enable you on your phone to get an accurate diagnosis uh, if you're standing on a beach or you're standing on a mountain. Um, when you think about the impact of that to an organization and what it would take for healthcare to get to that space, um, it forces you to think about, well, what would it take for us as an organization to prepare for that? Then we have a couple of trends which really focus on consumerism or a couple of forecasts rather that focus on consumerism. So we talk about the patient will see you now. That's the idea that, that we all um, are amassing these vast amounts of information on ourselves. And yet when you think about it, your medical record isn't really, doesn't feel like it's owned by you. And there's a lot of stuff increasingly that's not in your medical record. You know, I, I have my Apple watch on, right? Um, and my Apple Watch collects all sorts of data on me, but that is not in my medical record. And, and this idea of the patient being able to see you now means that, that we believe that there will be a day when consumers will be in much more control of their health care. And providers will need to respond to that. Um, others will try to influence that. And it's, it's, you know, it becomes a question of will the organization that allows you to aggregate that information the best uh, be the winner? You know, if you think about platforms, uh, like Apple or Google or others, where you can put all of that information together with your medical record. That really, I think, highlights uh, a level of simplicity and consumer uh, convenience that we don't see today. And so the patient will see you now is, is really about consumerism. Uh, there was this concept in our third forecast about virtual interactions outpacing uh, physical. And that shouldn't really be a surprise to anybody. It shouldn't be a surprise, especially after the last nine months and, 
you know, one of the highlights of this one is that we, we had a lot of internal debate because we predicted that there would be a billion virtual visits uh, that would occur by 2025. And, and based on where healthcare was in 2019, uh, that was probably considered laughable, right? Yeah. And um, lo and behold, two months into the pandemic, we hit 2 billion visits. Um, and, and we're on a pace to far exceed that uh, as we look toward the future now. Uh, okay. Then we talk about things like reimbursement and business models. And, and, and we have this belief that the current business model, uh, healthcare is, is one of those last uh, iconic industries that hasn't gone through the consumer transformation, we would say like finance or like hospitality, uh, the airlines. You know, When you think about this, uh, if you will, consumer revolution that's occurred in those spaces, that's, that's driven down prices, that's brought uh, new levels of convenience, that's allowed a much more competitive environment. Uh, healthcare hasn't experienced a lot of that, but we believe that it will. And, and we believe that um, today's reimbursement model will not be the one that exists in 2030. Um, and uh, that's the challenge for most industries. Navigating through a space of rapid industry transformation is what separates the winners from the losers. You know, look no further than your local bank and how that's changed you know, over the last 20 years, over the last 15 years even. Um, the way that you book a hotel, right? Um, you know, those sorts of things we believe will come to healthcare. And then our final forecast is for, for us near and dear to Mayo Clinic because we have a three shield mission of practice, education and research. Um, those are really game changers because it, it forces you to think differently and creatively and put together parts and pieces um, that really uh, advance the field of medicine and uh, that engagement with consumers. So, so these five forecasts were kind of, they were landmark work for us. Uh, we started by kind of playing around with it and we said, yeah, what if, what if we put together these, you know, these things in a forecast to make it uh, more easy to understand than, you know, reading about 30 trends and trying to put it together. And it was really yeah. well received. Yeah, I, I love this. I love all of this stuff. I think you're right. You have the best job in healthcare. I mean, <laughs> non-clinical, let's just, we'll just say, obviously right. the clinicians are, um, or where it's at, but, but outside of that. Um, and I think so, what's fun to me is to look at these and it's, it's always hard to, to think about these unless you're you and you're, and you are paid to do this on a regular basis, but how do these actually come to fruition? And the, the one where it's just the patient can, you know, will see you now, the implications of that, what it makes me think about is, is I try to draw a, a, an allusion to, well, where is that played out in other places of our lives? And I think about shopping online and I think about 20 years ago um, or whenever it was where shopping was, you had to plan to go somewhere based on the hours of that store. Uh, and you were limited in what you could do based on how far you could travel. Uh, if you're at the mall, obviously you could see more stores and so on. And then gradually we got online commerce, but of course it wasn't mobile optimized. You still had to be sitting at a computer and it was clunky and slow and weird. Uh, and we've gotten to a place now that you can just basically, you know, shop whenever you want from your phone for almost anything you want. Uh, and, and it's not just the technology and the access, but the mindset of that is crazy. Like, I think I have an Amazon delivery coming every day for the past two weeks and for the next two weeks. And it's not all Christmas gifts. It's like, oh, I need this. Boom, done. I'm just done. Like you think about it, you do it and you're done. Uh, imagine that when it comes to our health, if we could really access a level of clinical care that's beneficial. And if our mindset is of that, what that might mean for individual health and in, in health in this country. So, so to me, it's like, you think about the patient will see you now and it's like, oh, I can schedule my appointments when I want. It just goes so much further than that. It really does. It, it, it also begs this interesting question though, is, is it becomes more convenient. We typically become more, con, you know, we're, we're a greater consumer of those services, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. You know, as, as, as uh, I, I love uh, watching Target, right? Target during the pandemic. So before the pandemic, I think Target said, well, there are, there are seven ways to shop uh, in our facilities. You know, you can shop online, you can go in the store, you know, all these other things. But if you look at how they've doubled down on the convenience factor, um, uh, kind of post pandemic, right? I, I watch our local target, right? So the, the drive up pickup, I don't know if you've, if you guys have used that feature, 
uh, we just kind of locked onto it as a family about three weeks ago. And now almost every day there's a Target pickup. And, and the stalls at our, at our local Target, at first they had two drive-by lanes, and now they take up an entire row, which means that there are probably 12 to 14 spots. And, and you know, that's great from a convenience standpoint. But then I look and I'm like, wow, you know, we've made 15 trips to Target <laughs> it's the 12th of the month, right? You know, and, and, you know, if you play that out in healthcare, that presents some unique challenges for us as well as, as consumers, you know, engage more with their healthcare, that's good. Um, but the consumption of that resource uh, might not always be the best. So yeah. uh, it'll prompt some other changes. Yeah, and, and the implications of what you described and what I described, we're not even thinking about the environmental cost of 12 cars in line at Target waiting for their pickup or the everyday delivery by UPS of my package that's about this big with two things in it that I could have just gone to Target to get. But now I'm programmed to be like, why would I, why would I drive five minutes to Target? Like, why, who does that? Boop, boop, boop. I'm not even thinking about the broader implication to your point. Uh, so yeah, that's where it gets really exciting to kind of dig into this. Let's transition a little bit though and talk about this year. Uh, obviously this is a, a unique year. What have you, you know, can you just share a little bit about what you've observed and some of the implications coming out of 2020? And, and a lot of that is COVID-19 related, but it's not just COVID-19, right, to be fair? Right. Yeah, in, in our line of work, you know, one of the dangers uh, when you're looking and trying to predict the future is everybody asks you, well, how will you know that you're accurate, right? How, 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 how can we trust or, you know, why should we believe um, that you're accurate? And we, we try to do it with a certain level of precision, but in the end, there's, there's a fair amount of art in our work as well. And so I want to walk you guys through this uh, little bit of a journey. Um, so in 2019, as we were projecting out to 2030 again, we, we picked up on these themes that we said, these, these are probably going to be themes that emerge. Uh, they've emerged in our research, but they're things that will we'll be expecting to happen sometime over the next 10 years. So this massive increase uh, in AI innovation and, and really affecting all quarters and, and broad impact from that. Um, cybersecurity, you know, uh, some of these will appear obvious, but, but cybersecurity from the standpoint of moving from attacks on individuals to attacks on hospitals, on mm -hmm. government entities, um, you know, hint, we haven't seen that play out in the last couple of weeks, but um, you know, that, that sort of thing increasing over the next 10 years, this idea that big tech would, would not stay just in the realm of technology, but would disrupt uh, multiple different industries, you know, beyond uh, retail like they have uh, in other sectors. Um, this, this rise of consumerism, almost consumers um, feeling a need to take control over their information because Frankly, they have more information on themselves than, than what a healthcare provider might have. Maybe less information than what Facebook might have on them, but, but they have a lot of information at their fingertips. Yeah. Uh, we said, you know, hey, we're due for an economic downturn. We actually said there'll probably be two economic downturns over the next 10 years. And bear in mind, this is 2019. Um, we pictured a day as we head toward 2030 where there would be job losses due to automation and um, just uh, the technology implementations. Uh, that were occurring. Unaffordability is a, is a big concern for us um, in healthcare, uh, and that should be a big concern for any, I think, healthcare organization. Uh, innovation acceleration, not surprising. Then we said, um, as we look at 2030, we see increasing social division. We saw signs of it starting in 2019, um, and, uh, and that was something that was concerning us because, uh, you know, the, the the haves were getting more, um, and, and those who were less fortunate were, were getting into a bigger hole. And so uh, that set up some themes for us as we started thinking about our strategy and the things that were going to play out. And so, then, Adam, yeah. you're telling us you did this, you didn't just create this slide like three days ago. Yeah. <laughs> no, 19, right? No, yeah. Just checking. I, I, I'm just checking. I should have probably put the date on here. This would have, uh, we would have done this uh, in, uh, in roughly October of uh, 2019 uh, before there was any conversation about a pandemic. And, right. and I will note that you will know that there is, pandemic is not listed on this. Um, you know, mm, uh, yeah. if, if it would have been, we, we probably would have been saying, hey, we might have, we might have bigger careers than another, uh, you know, in <laughs> fortune telling or something like that. Right. Uh, so then, um, so then let's look at 
what happened in 2020. And we have that in a series of pictures that you'll see here. Now, uh, you know, un unfortunately, I would say uh, many of those pictures come from from our home state of, of Minnesota, and it shows uh, some of the challenges that we faced here. So then, um, let's go back, Chase. If you can, if you can bring up the 2020 view then of of those trends, uh, you know, what you saw through those pictures is, and 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 this is. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to be biased here, but I would say, wow, um, you know, we were even surprised. A lot of those things happened. Um, and, uh, you know, we felt, we felt good that our predictions were right for all of about seven seconds. Um, and then we realized that many of these things across this list um, happened about seven years faster than what we thought it would. And that's the rate of change that we're faced with. And there are three things that we, that we changed um, due to our, ex, you know, our external review of 2030. The first one was that we've introduced this new uh, concern over safety and security and every decision that we make as consumers now, I would, I would argue that almost every decision is based on this idea of do I feel safe and is it secure? In our online lives, in our in-person lives, uh, we're worried about COVID, we're worried about um, even security and environments, we're worried about um, or we should be worried about is how is our information being used? Um, that issue of safety and security is not something that we considered as consumers prior to the pandemic. I mean, maybe if you were walking down a dark alley in the middle of the night, you might've been a little bit worried about your security, but you didn't worry about passing someone in a hallway who was coughing and if that would lead to you getting COVID. The workforce changes are different than we thought they would. Certainly there were job losses, there were a bunch of furloughs, um, there were lower incomes, but also there are hundreds of thousands of people that got sent home to telework. I'm one of them. I was in an office every day uh, prior to March 19th, and I have been in my home office every day since uh, March 19th. And just the adjustment that that makes for, I think our society is important. And then uh, we've introduced this concept of ongoing instability, whether that's political instability or uh, market instability. Um, and if you just look at the, the highs and lows, some of them honestly don't make sense. When you compare the economy to the market, um, mm -hmm. you would say, well, the economy uh, is in a recession, rebounding out of a recession. Uh, the market, you know, had like three days where it was like, oh, this is bad. And then it's been gangbusters. Um, and for organizations, uh, the juxtaposition of one day you're experiencing greatness, uh, the next day you are faced with enormous uh, challenges and disruption to your industry. Um, that's this new kind of new normal that organizations are gonna have to have uh, super adaptive strategies. It, it, it's just, I don't know, it's a bit overwhelming to see where you guys are at now with what's going forward, especially that last one, Adam, I think, um, I, I couldn't agree more with it, even though it's kind of about chaos. It's about instability. So it's hard to say so you, would, I don't, I don't want it. I don't, I'm not saying that, or even agreeing with the idea that it's going to be all over the place is a weird thing to say, but uh, I just don't know how we, we find stability anytime soon in, in a lot of the ways that you're talking about. Um, the other thing that's interesting to me is that innovation acceleration, uh, particularly in healthcare, right? What we've seen this year is just insane. You talked about the, the virtual visits, which is usually the example that everybody talks about that, you know, um, your prediction, you know, of a billion by 2030, and we had two by two billion by May or whatever it was. We, you know, we have quoted on this show, working with systems that have gone from zero, you know, zero, because they didn't do any to 25,000 a week, which is just insane. We've also heard though, stories, though I don't know if I've verified any of them, but they're in trade publications, so I'm going to assume they're probably right, where you have um, CIOs of, of health systems saying, we have advanced a technology project in what was going to be 12 months, 18 months, two years, in three weeks, right. because we had to, we had no choice. And that's not just about virtual care, it's about other things too. Um, just kind of crazy 
what this year did. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one thing that we've learned as an organization is that, uh, and, and I'm sure most other organizations would have this same uh, thing, but when you have an intense singular focus, you can be very rapid. Uh, where we run into trouble as organizations, as healthcare providers, is, is you know, we have strategies that, that have 25 items on them, right? Um, and I remember when I was in my MBA program, uh, one of the professors said, look, you know, uh, anytime you have more than four strategies, your odds of accomplishing any one of them is under 25%. Um, you know, and, and yet as, as organizations, uh, and, and even me personally, right? Uh, I can't get down to a single goal, right? I, I need to do multiple things in any given time, but that, that strains and stresses an organization um, and it, it lengthens uh, the time frame to accomplish those things. COVID I think is a perfect example of, we really had a singular focus. Um, and when you invest all of your time, energy and resources into that singular focus, you can move pretty, pretty rapidly. Yeah, for sure. Just an encouragement to people to, if you've got questions for Adam, myself, Chase, put them in the Q&A chat so we can get to those. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, thank you, by the way, we should all thank you for being willing to share some of the things that your group has found with all of us, because uh, certainly understandable if you would be like, no, this is ours. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Uh, and I know there's plenty of that as well, but even just sharing those, we had questions come up almost immediately. Like, is he going to share? Is he going to tell us what, what the predictions were? So really appreciate that. Um, you know, what, what tools or what insights do you use to help guide this kind of work? Uh, or even just down to strategic decision-making, how are you advancing that? Right. Well, the, you know, the, the, the key, you know, and, and the reason why I feel comfortable is that that our secret sauce is our people, right? Our people who are pulling these insights together and the, the conversations that we have internally um, about that, right? So that's something that, that can't be recreated anywhere. And every organization would do that differently uh, based, based on their talent. But we have, um, I have a team that, that is, is, is very good, is, is very curious. Um, and the debates that we have are, are you know really what what leads to the secret sauce uh, because you think that you have an idea and then your colleague has a better much better idea and then somebody <laughs> else introduces but what if um, and you find yourself on this path of whoa that was much better than than what I was thinking originally um, we talked I think uh, Chris leading up to this about a few different tools that we use and one of the tools that we uh, that we use is we look at scenarios so we uh, develop scenarios it's I, I liken it to a day in the life, you know? So we have these three scenarios for 2030, this day in the life of 2030. One of them is an expectable scenario. And, and when you develop these scenarios, you think about, okay, well, what does, what does uh, the economic environment look like in 2030? What is unemployment and automation? So, you, so, so we, these are actually documents, they're written documents. Um, you would read it and, and you would, you know, have an understanding of, oh, so this is what life would be like then. And, uh, and we did that. Uh, we did that uh, as well in 2018, 2019. Um, and what you're seeing here is that we had this expectable, we had a challenging and a visionary uh, scenario. Um, and you would expect the expectable to be, you know, what life is like. But the, the lines here show in the past year where we're tracking against those scenarios. So, so we haven't necessarily seen, okay, we're out of the scope of our three scenarios. But we, what I think is interesting is that 2020 has shown us that Oh, we're trending more toward that challenging scenario, which um, you know it it paints kind of a bleak picture of that 2030 environment. Now, do I expect that we'll end there? No. Do I expect some of the elements uh, will remain there? Probably. Um, but it's just been a good tool for us to set a set a flag uh, uh, in the ground on what that what three possibilities of that 2030 environment might look like, and then we can use that. Uh, as our guidepost and measure, okay, well, which one are we tracking toward? Yeah, the, it, it, again, not to belabor the negative, like let's keep our symbolic solstice, the 21st, the vaccines going out, all that in our mind. But it, it does it does remind me of, it feels like 2020 is like a patient that had cardiac arrest and we're all still in the ED 
saving that patient and doing whatever we need to at the, in this acute moment. And that's all we're focused on, right? So um, we need a stimulus, we need it now. Throw another trillion on the, you know, on the board, right? It, but we're not, we, have, we haven't had time to think about the implications of some of those things that you had on there. I don't know if you can bring it back up, Chase. Uh, government debt as one. Right. right. We need to do what we need to do. And we're all kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll have to deal with that later. Yeah. Um, unemployment. We're going to have to deal with that later. Um, the the inequality that we see in this country um, there is up there. Thank you. Uh, where we talk about the haves and the haves nots. And you see stories about, wow, look at the haves. The haves are crushing it. Like the billionaires are crushing it in 2020. Yet uh, the people on the other end, the 99% or let's say the 95%, they're, a lot of them are struggling. And the implications of that, we're not in a place that we can really reconcile or start to deal with. But you've kind of shown, hey, this is like in general, we're going to be in a challenging place as a result of a lot of things that happened in 2020, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that that's true, but we're also seeing a lot of very visionary things emerge too. Mm -hmm. like if you look at how this vaccine was developed, right? Moderna, right. what did they, they had their blueprint within two days uh, and how long would it normally take to develop a vaccine? A few years um, at best. So the question that, that we keep asking, that our team keeps asking is what sticks? You know, when, when, when we get into whenever the pandemic is over, what what of those efforts during the, the pandemic stick and what kind of pull back to the way that they were pre-pandemic? And uh, for many items, that's an unanswered question. Uh, you know, we have, some, we have some guesses, even virtual care, you would look, you know, you look at that. And when we were forced to do, we could do, you know, 70% of our healthcare uh, virtually. And now I think you're seeing many organizations say, well, we wanna continue to do virtual, we wanna grow in virtual, but you know, optimistically, it's twenty five percent of the care. Okay, so let's let's get to some questions. We got some questions for you, Adam. Um, they have to be easy questions. That was that was part okay. of the contract negotiation. Let me scroll, right? scroll, scroll. Let me see what I got here. Um, so, so can you speak a little bit to what your group has found related to the healthcare workforce? You mentioned, you know, just in general, not in healthcare, folks. Obviously, many moving to working from home. Um, do you do you see anything, or do you have any thoughts on what that might mean for healthcare workers moving forward, coming out of the pandemic? How much of what's happening now might stick, or do we see it just kind of reverting back to where it was once it's safe to do so? Mm -hmm. do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it is interesting. Workforce has been on our mind a lot, and and we had done a briefing on workforce of the healthcare workforce of 2030 prior to the pandemic. Um, there are a few things at play, I think, that that need to be considered with the pandemic. So prior to the pandemic, um, we were going to be competing a lot for talent as we head into the latter half of of this decade or next decade. We we didn't really settle on which decade. We did it. Nobody, uh, somebody help us in the chat function. But please. there were fewer people interested in healthcare. Um, it's it's super expensive uh, to get a degree uh, in in healthcare, um, and on the flip side, there's an opportunity for automation, uh, which could could change some jobs. Uh, healthcare is also an industry where jobs that exist in 2030 are not even thought of today. Um, I think what we've learned is that there are a lot of things that can be done, including many jobs that can be done uh, virtually. And I suspect that, that many healthcare providers will uh, stick with that, which, uh, which begs the question of what does the physical footprint look like in the future? Um, uh, and you know, that has a direct impact on the cost of healthcare uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So probably not real specific answers there, but those are some of the things that we think about. Okay, uh, another question. Did you, or how did you, in, as you as you kind of reassess your 2030 outlook, uh, allow for other pandemics? Or even, I don't know, I saw a report yesterday that somewhere, England, somewhere in Europe, mm -hmm. discovered a mutation of yeah. COVID-19 that's worth yeah. noting, right? So God forbid that this thing mutates and gets worse. We're yeah. assuming we're going to come out of this, you know, again, solstice, positivity, um, but the odds that there's another pandemic before 2030 are 
somewhat decent. I mean, we have them every few years. They don't typically get this bad, but did you guys consider that at all? Yeah, it's it's interesting that you asked that question, um, and 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 I'll bear a little bit of my soul in that it it uh, it pains me a little bit to put a pandemic on there because I feel like oh that should be obvious and it looks like we're doing a a me too like yeah looking in the rearview mirror oh yeah there's probably going to be another pandemic um, I think uh, the thing about our work that you'll find is it's really hard to predict black swan events just by their very nature right right now you could argue. Should we have thought about a pandemic um, going into this? And you could probably argue both both sides of that argument. Um, the thing that that I would say though is that if you look at those you know those themes uh, that we have, um, those were all impacted by a pandemic. So you may not have predicted a pandemic, but the things you know those themes that occur and and the impact of those things are outcomes of a pandemic that you would need to be prepared mm -hmm. for. Now, realistically, I think that um, I think that there, you know, we we should probably anticipate there may be another pandemic um, at, at some point. Um, but I think we're learning a lot as as a nation, as a world, about how to respond to it uh, much differently than than what we did uh, this time. Perfect. Okay, another question for you. This is a little more business oriented, but I think it's. It's a great question. Uh, you know, we have seen maybe a, a settling down of m a in our space um, for a number of reasons, but it was humming along there for a while. Part of the reason it's slowed down, I think, is because we're starting to see evidence that it's actually not providing value in, in the ways that you would want it to. Uh, but also, we're going to have changes in the federal government. We're going to have changes in, in who heads HHS. Um, we have, you know, the government starting to get aggressive in terms of antitrust with some of the tech companies. Uh, do you have you guys thought about, or do you have any thoughts on where that side of things might go? Are we going to see, you know, at one point we were talking about we may end up with ten health systems in this country, like real consolidation. Um, do we, are we still seeing something like that, or is it going to? kind of bounce along where it's at, or is it gonna go back the other way and we're gonna see a slowdown or uh, these are gonna become more rare events? Yeah, almost all of our forecasts do include a, a, a higher level of consolidation. But the question is, is I think, and you, you highlighted it, is, is that consolidation beneficial to the consumer? Um, that hasn't always been the case in the past. If you look at consolidations, um, with the intent to reduce cost and bring efficiencies, they haven't necessarily yielded that. Um, and so that's what prompts the federal government to say, well, wait a minute. And, and they've been more aggressive in some of these consolidations. And so I think that, um, I think, you know, the, the, the burden on healthcare providers, especially um, remote, you know, kind of rural healthcare providers and their finances are going to force probably some level of consolidation. Um, what uh, remains to be determined is how that's actually beneficial uh, to the consumer um, and ultimately helps us deliver better healthcare. Well, I mean, we can get really wonky, Adam, you and I, because you've been around long enough to remember our um, our former attorney general, Mike Hatch, yeah. who actually went at this in a different way. And I think it's an interesting way to think about M&A. It's as much about provider and provider as it is provider and payer. Yeah. Because if you have United and Optum and they started, you know, exponentially growing in the way that they're, that they are, have started, you've got a different kind of market constriction, a different kind of potential monopoly. Um, what I'm referring to is, I don't know, it was probably 20 years ago, uh, our attorney general broke up an integrated system. Mm -hmm. So much like a Geisinger or a Intermountain where the provider and the payer were all as one, uh, we had two of them. We had Alina and Medica, which were together, and we had health partners. And he went after Alina Medica, Alina the provider, split apart from the insurer, then he went after health partners and health partners fought back and health partners won and today still is an integrated system. I wonder if there's as much of that M&A concern going forward as there would be just provider to provider. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see. I think you're also going to see changes as administrations change too. That's one of the, yeah. one of the questions about 
uh, you know, this ongoing instability that we raise is will every four or every eight years we have this kind of whiplash political environment um, that that could be challenging for a lot of organizations. Yeah, and that seems like a relatively new thing. Um, relatively new through executive order, right? And then the yeah. executive order can be erased on day or, one. New executive orders are written. Yeah, we would have large pieces of federal legislation that once they were passed, like that's it. You know, right. like hey, we're going to do, um, you know, we're going to bring in social security. We're going to bring in. Uh, I'm drawing a blank, but all the stuff Johnson did, you know, Civil Rights Act, all of that stuff. Well, that's it. And you know, we've had a decade of attacks on legislation, the ACA as in our world as an example of trying to go roll back. Um, and yeah, the last four years was a lot of that through executive order or otherwise, um, you know, treaties being, exiting treaties and all that kind of stuff. That is real instability that I don't know, I'm not a historian that we've dealt with. Um, and this is not to point blame at one political side or the other. It just seems to be within the last 10 years, a new a new dimension for us. Um, one more question. Let's do one more question, Adam. How do you feel about the impact of price transparency on what we do? Do you feel, well, just give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, so, so I think that it's probably necessary in most other industries that have gone through a significant transformation. Um, you know the price that you're gonna pay for that service. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't book a hotel without knowing, uh, you know, how much you're going to pay and how it compares to other places. Now, healthcare is way more complex. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, but um, you know, the 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 pricing transparency is really to put, and I think honestly to protect uh, the consumer more than than what we're seeing today. So, I think that's something that organizations are going to have to um, they're going to have to be prepared for. Um, you know, and it's, I think it's the first step toward uh, really shining some light on the price of healthcare, how it varies organization, organization, geography to geography, um, and, and put more um, control on the consumer. All right. So uh, one last thing here, Chase has put a resource uh, in the chat function. Uh, we actually released, Revive Health released uh, some consumer trends that we were we, that are notable to us. Would love to have you critique them, Adam. But it looks like we're out of time. Yeah. So <laughs> for another time, <laughs> <laughs> maybe another time we can have you look at it. But I, I think there's some good stuff in there, so people can check that out. So thankful that you could join us, Adam. Thank Pleasure. you so much. Yeah. Really for sharing everything. That was fantastic, Chase, my friend. Uh, absolutely enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, we will see everybody again in 2021. If you have something you want us to cover in the new year, we've got some great guests lined up for January already. Somebody from the, can I say this out loud, Chase? Somebody from the WHO is going to be joining. Um, so we're going to, we finish really strong and we're going to start off really strong in January, we're taking the next two weeks off. Hope you guys get to do that too. But let us know if you have uh, things you want us to cover as we move into 2021. You can put them in the chat channel right now. You can email us at nonormal at thinkrevivehealth.com. Remember uh, to subscribe on iTunes or wherever to listen to the podcast. Check out a recording if you want to share this show with anybody on our website by the end of the day, thinkrevivehealth.com slash COVID-19. I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday. Everybody stay safe uh, throughout and good luck out there in the new normal. We will see you, I can't believe I'm saying this, in 2021. Fantastic. <laughs>